and music, I've had this conversation with a lot of masculine men in my life, I would say, guys, to be corn or the Deftones or Helmet or a tool, I said, it's so easy to get on stage and play in front of millions of people with distortion and rage and like this rock. But I said, take one of those musicians, put an acoustic guitar in their hand and have them write a song of their soul and bear witness to these millions of people. And I said, it takes far more strength to be vulnerable than it does to be tough. Like to cry in front of someone, right? Than it is to like yell at someone. Welcome back to The Medicine Podcast. My name is Mimi and I have my glorious partner in life and love and podcasting here with me. What is going on, everybody? We are amped up today. Have a special friend, someone who has been in our community, but we haven't quite gotten a chance to connect with yet. But today is the day. Ian Morris, welcome to The Medicine Podcast, my friend. Thank you guys for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be great. Even just in our our short conversation before pushing record, um, you are absolute tribe. I can tell right away. <laughs> um, <laughs> the first question that we ask every guest on the medicine is, "What do you love in your life? What aspect of your life do you love so much that you wish you could gift it to every human?" Oh. <laughs> um. I think the biggest thing for me is like every day I get up and I'm excited to learn. Like I'm just so curious about so many different things. And I mean, you can see the the books behind me. I blame Paul for this yeah. back here. <laughs> but but, but uh, I think since I met Paul, I've probably bought 100, 150 books at least, you know, just in the year and a half that I've known Paul. And just reading and learning and being around people that are more knowledgeable, have more experience. And I think I'm just really a curious person. And I think if I could pass anything on, it would just be the inspiration for curiosity, like to learn and grow on a daily basis. I think it gives you a mission and a drive to get up and, and do something good in the world each day, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. I mean, Absolutely. We're, we're the exact same way. I think we're, we're indoctrinated with this idea that curiosity is is not safe. And to be curious mm-hmm. out of outside of anything that you've been told through kind of the traditional learning structures is not safe and it's risky and you shouldn't even think outside of the box, <laughs> God forbid. Uh, but, but, yeah. but we're the same. I mean, th- how fun is it that we get to continue to learn through the the rest of our life? And that, I mean, to me, I think this used to feel defeating. But now it's it's actually quite beautiful, which is that there will always be more to yeah. learn. There's always something else. And you don't surely don't cap out after college, which is kind yeah. of what <laughs> we're all accustomed to doing. Um, but there's really no like like capping the capacity mm-hmm. to learn in the, in the human life. And that li- lights me up on a daily basis. So I totally share that with you, man. Yeah, totally. Oh. Yeah, I, I think of the, you know, sometimes we're like, we we talk at the dinner table and we're like, what would you go back and study? If you could go back to school, what would you want to learn? And through our, you know, conversation, we come to the the end realization that's like, wait, we can just do these things. Yeah. We can just yeah. study philosophy if we want to now. We yeah. don't have to go back and get a degree for it. We have the means, we have the ability, we have the drive and the curiosity to just learn about it now and to learn about what we want now. So it's like, we don't need to go back and do that. Like we can just lean into these passions and um, interests now. And also like with the means of the podcast, like what a gift to be able to talk to someone like you, learn from someone like you. Like if we didn't have this podcast, like would we ever sit down and have a you know 90 minute to two hour conversation with someone like you and learn from you? I don't know. And it, yeah. it's it's just a, this is one of our vehicles for learning. And uh, I'm so grateful for it. So yeah, thank you again for for being here with us and, and gifting your knowledge and your genius and your expertise in this area um, to our listeners as well. It's a huge blessing. Yeah. Well, I think something that's really cool too, to add to what you just said is the technology that's available. There is a lot of downfall and a lot of cons to it, but the pro is, is that we're living in a time where we could literally learn anything from home that we want to, you know, with, with things like YouTube and there's just so many published documents and educational documents that have been made public. And there's a lot of networks that have opened up to share information like holistic communities and podcasts like this. And so I think like, we're just truly blessed. And I think a lot of us forget like how much is out there and like we kind of lose 
like if a, a child ever says i'm bored i'm like man there's just so much to do now yeah. like, you know like when, when we were yeah. kids that was you know was not even available and so it's just such a different time period it's it's um it's really neat to be alive right now yeah, hundred percent. Well, I want to get into a little bit of your your story and your backstory, which is beautiful and, and and completely wild. But maybe before we do, if you could give our listeners a little bit of a, a brief summary as to you know what you're doing in the world, what are, what are you imprinting the world with, bringing this this passion that you have for sound and music to life. Maybe give our listeners a little bit of a summary of 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 your current impact on the world. Yeah. So my name's Ian Morris, and I run a company called Listening to Smile. And we are a unique sound healing company. So we really specialize in licensing and our target focus is really holistic practitioners. So a lot of practitioners don't realize by using Spotify in their place of business that they're breaking copyright law. So what we're trying to do is to make it fair for musicians as well as the people who are wanting to utilize the music. So we've created a multi-use platform for licensing that gives people the ability to use it on social media, commercials, podcasts, but they can also resell to clients, which you can't do with Spotify, and then creating music that's frequency-based. So we're looking at body organ frequencies, chakra, planetary, you know, channeled frequencies, light languages, curtain, shamanic drumming. So it's a, it's a whole plethora of music, but we've also added more modern things like trip-hop, hip-hop folk music, pop music, that is all frequency based and people can utilize it in movement based, you know, like uh, physical training, they can do walking meditations, they can do uh, cleaning their house, walking their dog using this frequency music, but then they also have yoga mat and meditation, uh, sound healing, shamanic journeys, you know, the whole, the whole gamut, we've tried to create a soundtrack for healing and release work is what we've done. Oh, wow! Awesome. I mean, I want to I want to pull on a couple of these threads. First, can you go into uh, maybe some of the copyright violations? I think this is probably yeah. something that many of us don't quite understand. Yeah. yeah. So Spotify, you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So um, when I w- we were working at Carnegie Mellon, we did some events at Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And while we were doing those events, a woman came to me and she had a paper where she was getting sued uh, from BMI, which is a performing rights organization, saying that she had 50, I want to say it was like 54 teachers in six different yoga studios, and they were all using Spotify playlists. And so she was getting sued for $150,000. And she said, I just don't understand. I have the $9, $10 a month plan. I'm paying for it. And I said, well, you do, but that's for your car, your house. It's for you personally. It's not for you to let all the yoga teachers use. And I said, can <clears throat> I said, just walk with me for a minute, like talk to me. And I said, if I took a video of you doing yoga and I put my music to it in the background and I uploaded it to YouTube and it got a million views. And I said, and you saw that and I didn't ask you permission. I said, how would you feel about it? And she was like, oh, I'd be upset. And I said, okay, but you're taking how much money each yoga class, people paying to come to your class, and you're using somebody else's music, and you're not asking permission. And I said, so for example, I had a friend that was really a great musician. He made ambient music, but he could not stand uh, Reiki or energy work. He thought it was all just mumbo jumbo. He wasn't into it. You know what I mean? Um, Which that's everyone's own different opinions, right? And we have that ability to have that option in life. And so this person was using his music at a yoga studio and he got so mad. And I said, it's kind of like someone using somebody's music in a presidential campaign at that the morals and ideals don't line up with the musician. It's very similar. So I said, these practices are in place not only to get permission to make sure it's in alignment with the creator, but it's also to give them money because you're using their craft and their tool to make money in your own business. And so I said, really, what we're talking about is integrity. And it's not really the public's fault, because Napster and all of these other programs like YouTube and Spotify have decimated the music community, the industry, um, because everyone can get everything for free, and they don't have to put any, you know, investment into that. So There's some really great things as far as like people will say, well, you get more exposure. And I'm like, that works to a certain point, but people still have to pay bills and do, you know, live life like everyone else. So we tried to create a program that, like, for instance, if you buy a CD 
from someone at a concert and you're using it in your practice, that's also a violation of copyright law because you haven't obtained the proper license or um, permissions to utilize that music. And let's say that people start coming to that practitioner saying, man, the music is so awesome and yeah. the environment they're creating. And, you know, they're generating hundreds or thousands of dollars a year by utilizing this certain type of music without permission. And so, like, I think everyone realizes, like, the more that we can be in synergy and in alignment with supporting each other, giving to each other, I feel like it's going to be a better world and it's the new paradigm that we're moving into. So we tried to create a program, our member slash affiliate program, to not only educate people about these things, but also to show them an alternative where they can actually create multiple revenue streams and have um, a way to have more tools to utilize in their tool belt with their own holistic practice. And so we're currently working with Cliff Bar. We're talking to some other businesses in the wellness, like uh, corporate wellness or uh, you know programs. But we are really focused on holistic practitioners. I would say that that's our first foundation that we really love to work with. And so um, this year we are branching out a little bit into the corporate wellness because I feel like we're able to hit more of the mainstream and get them kind of curious. Uh, that'll be our keyword for today yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, about this type of lifestyle, the wellness and mindfulness type lifestyle. And so I feel like it's something that is our mission is to really kind of make listening to smile a go-to for uh, sound healing and a variety of different, you know, options in that realm. Wow. Okay. Well, I was today years old when I found <laughs> out uh, all of this. I had no idea. Gym owners, yoga studios, yeah. massage therapists, like if you're using Spotify or even like Pandora, I would assume like anything that's not something that you paid for specifically for each song with the proper licensing to uh, what I'm hearing you say, is, and it makes sense now when you break it down that those practitioners, whatever, whoever they are, they're creating an experience for their client or patient or whoever. And the music is such yeah. a huge part of the experience of the thing. And so if you're, if you don't have permission by the artist to do that or own the music, then I can see how, I mean, most people are probably not going to get caught, but it's also like, what are the energetics behind it too, to think yeah. about? Um, wow, you just blew my mind. And I'm sure so many <laughs> people listening too had no idea. Like, that's wild. Did yeah, you know that? I did. Um, and, and it's, you know, something in podcasting that's actually been, because these intro and outro yeah, I knew uh, that. Uh, snips of different songs. And a lot of times if you, it, most people are using, you know, like Bon Jovi or something and they have no clue that they're actually doing something that's, that's illegal on yeah. copyright. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's more eye opening because I think every single one of us have done it. Our generation grew up with LimeWire, Napster, yeah. And we're accustomed to, and and not just music, but movies. We're ripping off shit that would have been paid for in years in the past. Yeah, and it's become such a default mode for so many of us that I think it's just wildly important as to what you're educating on. Not only just the the legal element of this, but the spiritual element as well. Um, I, I'd love to hear a little bit from you on general sound healing. I think so many of us hear the concept and. Uh, we're like, oh yeah, sound is so beautiful that, you know, if I'm in a bad mood, I might wake up uh, after, you know, 30 minutes of, of listening to a particular type of music and feel significantly better. Sound healing, easy, one-on-one. But I think it's more than that. And you talked a lot about, you know, the synchronization between the music specifically chosen for maybe like a, a part of your body or an organ. Can you go into that a little bit, like some of the energetics behind that and maybe some of the science behind how that actually works? Yeah. So I'll try not to get too sciencey and just make this really uh, layman because I feel like so many people grasp this so much easier. But basically, all things have a vibration. Every, every form, everything here in this perceived reality is a vibration of light or sound or both, you know. <laughs> and it's like, it's like, so there's a vibration with everything. So 
how I explain this to people is um, we all have friends who are negative and, and really play the victim. And, and I'm not saying that in a negative way. It's like everyone plays victim at some point in their life. Right. But I'm saying like, there's people who are just stuck in that mode in our friend circle sometimes who, or experience something that they've never experienced for, and they have a hard time shaking it off. And they're in that, that mode of just really dense negative energy. And when you're around them, if you hang out with that person too long, it will start rubbing off on you or it'll get you to a point where you're aggravated and you have to separate from that vibration. So in accordance, you know, the flip of that coin is that there's those really super positive, you know, silver lining people in our life who no matter what happens to them, they're like, zip it a doo da zip it a you know, like they're just super focus on positivity and i like if you notice these people in your life and you spend a prolonged period of time with them like visiting them talking to them emailing them they start rubbing off on you and you'll start seeing that vibration so this is a resonance that is happening where there is an entrainment process starting between these two vibrational states and so what I tell people is that this music that we're creating with listening to smile is that happy friend. That's our attempt to create that happy friend that is always there reminding you of the vibratory state that you should be in, you know, to, to be in a happy state of, you know, um, not, not being worried, not being anxious, you know, but being in flow state. And so it's creating a tool that can be that friend just to remind you like, Hey, have you, have you taken some time for yourself, put the feet, your feet in the grass and been, been in the sunshine? Have you done some exercise? Have you ate some good food today? And it's just really trying to um, help hold an alignment uh, for those all those multifacets that go into healing and, and also self-care, sustaining that, that positive flow state and that healthy you know, state of being. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's, mm. I, I love what you're bringing to light because I think for many of us, we roll through life and it seems to be random and we call it good fortune or good luck for those days that we wake up and the sun is shining and we're, we're singing zippity doodah and skipping throughout the day. But then tomorrow we get drop kicked in the crotch and also call it bad luck. And there are these things that we can pick up on and it's through awareness and education like you're doing that says like, hey, you're actually swimming upstream right now. You might want to turn around in the other direction and go with the current, with the vibration and kind of like set yourself up for success. It doesn't have to be happenstance. Um, I, I was sp speaking of like vibration. We were in, we were in um, Egypt for a month and we traveled to Egypt and, you know, we're 20 hours on an airplane and we're, we're pulling all nighters trying to get over there and, and we're, we get constipated, like like many people do when you're traveling, just brutally constipated. Of course. And we're, I'm days into this thing and haven't had a bowel movement. And I'm like, all right, healing frequencies for digestion. And really what it is, release. is relaxation of the yeah. sphincter uh, mechanism in the body. We held it down there. No. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I looked up some playlists and I'm, I'm sitting in the bathroom and sure we were enough, desperate. had a successful bowel movement after using the power of uh, healing frequencies. But like just speaking to the specific application of this stuff, man, it's, 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 yes, it's for mood and energy and, and, um, but it's also for specific nuanced acute issues, right? Yeah. So I've worked with people, I create custom frequencies for people. And so working with people, I call it personal frequency coaching. So it's a lot of people who are coming into sound healing or frequency, but don't understand it. They're wanting to learn more and also kind of get a template uh, of a daily routine to utilize to create movement of stagnant energy. So we, we usually work with people about two weeks and, you know, and then they're like, well, how many more sessions? And I'm like, you got everything you need. We just, we just need two weeks. And so we, we set up a, a basically a template of breath work, meditation and sound healing. And then we encourage like positive foods and movement for the body, but mostly sleep. Like we, we talk about the significance of sleep and how powerful that is. And then when we set up that two week period, I've never had, I think I won't say that. I think one person did a, a month, they did two, two week sessions, right? But everyone that we've ever worked with has done two weeks and seen the movement just like you did with, you know, having that issue. And so it's like, it's basically, I feel like it's inevitable. It's that if you put on the headphones, you listen to the music and you spend time 
where you're actually deeply listening, you're attentive and you're tuned in to your body, you start noticing immediately your body's response to this music. It's just very, very powerful. Mm-hmm. And I think um, it's just like, it, it's the same thing. The only thing I would say is plenty of fluids because it's just like getting a massage. It's like getting some kind of energy work done. It's very similar. Your body is going to move stagnant energy out of those meridians, the channels where it might be shut down and, and stumped and stagnant. And, um, I, I just think it's such a powerful tool for such little time investment and such little monetary investment. These can be done for, you know, 20, 25 bucks. You get some headphones, you know, basic headphones. You don't have to have $200 headphones to experience this. Um, it's nice. Nicer headphones, I will say, are nice. <laughs> but, sure. yeah. but you can experience this with $25, $30 headphones. And you can get music and sit down and do 20 minutes a day is what we tell people. 20 minutes, 10 minutes in the morning. 10 minutes at night before bed and then just do that for two weeks and you will see a difference. It's just, it's so positive for the way the body responds to taking that downtime. A lot of people forget to breathe like in their day. They're just so busy. They just don't take time to breathe or to just take in life because it's like from, from event to event to event and then bed, you know? And so I think just slowing down, I think the music is a tool to help people do that. Yeah, it's making me, you know, think of the the visual, and I, I'm sure <laughs> you're well versed in this. But um, is it cymatics or chymatics? Cymatics, Cymat- cymatics, mm-hmm. and and just for the listeners or viewers, like cymatics, and you can probably speak to this way more eloquently than I can. But essentially, it's the concept of we've probably seen the YouTube videos of uh, sprinkling something like sand or salt on top of a flat surface and you blast a certain frequency underneath or near it and the particles, whether it's sand or salt or whatever, organize themselves into a particular geometric, like usually perfectly symmetrical, beautiful geometric shape. You change the frequ- frequency or the resonance of the sound and then the the geometric shape also shifts. And so I'm, I'm picturing that as you're speaking happening for the for the person is that kind of the same concept yeah so if you think about it water um anything that is water crystalline base like a salt sugar things of a crystalline base like that um and and water uh can hold frequency you know and and pretty much everything in our living library you know earth is like you got the tree rings, you got the soil samples that record history, the tree rings record history, water stores memory and history in the water, and like living water does. And uh, and so, you know, you have these things that are constantly monitoring their environment and recording it. And the human body is a universe of this, you know, from our DNA to our cellular to the water, you know, the human body's made mostly of water, right? So um, it's just, it's really interesting to think like when you see cymatics in those vibration states and it brings up those really beautiful geometric patterns um, to not feel that the body is experiencing this on some type of level. And a lot of people who really tune in or, are intuitive, highly intuitive or sensitive people, when you put that music on them, oftentimes they will tell you when they come out of the session that they saw geometric patterns, Mm -hmm. they saw light, they saw different colors during the experience. So it's really interesting. Um, And I think everyone's experience is different with it because we're all at different vibratory states when we're listening to the music. Yeah, totally. Oh my God, that's so cool. So obviously you have a very unique niche in the world and in how you help people. Not only are you creating the music, you're assessing the person, the client and what they might need for their day and kind of, it sounds like individualizing it to their specific needs. This is amazing and very different than (laughs) anything, you know, anyone that we've spoken to or really, I've never heard of anyone else doing this exact thing. And we have to jump into your story because we. I want to come back to the music, but I want to give our listeners, um, you know, some backstory. Uh, your your story is completely wild, <laughs> in the most beautiful uh, way, and you've been through a lot of shit. And yeah. I wanna I wanna touch on that. I wanna pull on that thread a bit. So let's go back in time to young star athlete Ian Morris. <laughs> And, you know, let's just unravel that a little bit. Um, 
take us back and and where did this journey really start for you? Yeah, well, my dad's dad played minor league baseball <clears throat> and my dad was real into sports and uh, played football and baseball and he taught me how to pitch and I was just uh, when I was, you know, this will show my age, but when I was coming up, Nolan Ryan and Roger Clemens were like the pitchers. They were like, a, you know, the man, the man on the mound. But um, I just idolized them and I was really um, taken with Nolan Ryan and I just studied his form and I started really learning how to throw pretty hard. So I, when I was younger in uh, Pony League, I'd be like four, 13, 14 years old. Uh, the police used to come to my games and they would use their radar guns to see how fast I was throwing. And, and <laughs> I got on some travel teams where we played all over the country and umpires would tell me like, I just called strikes because I couldn't see the ball like you were thrown <laughs> so far. And so when I was in uh, 10th and 11th grade, I was throwing pretty hard. I was like in like... 85, 87. I got up to 90. When I was in 11th and 12th grade, I started throwing a lot harder and I started getting like college scouts, Georgia Tech, Florida State, all these different schools. But then some of the professional teams were coming to my games and scouts were talking to uh, my coaches. And so uh, during one of the games, uh, I was running around the bases and I just blacked out. I, you know, I'd hit the ball and I was running. And that's the reason why all the scouts were looking at me is because I could hit home runs and I was a good pitcher. Like one of the games I played, I had uh, two home runs and I pitched a two hitter uh, as a pitcher. And so there was a lot of um, interest because most of the time pitchers can't really hit. <laughs> and so, yeah, so, so basically I was running around the base one day and I just blacked out and I got taken to the hospital and I was ultimately diagnosed with mitral valve prolapse, which is like a heart arrhythmia valve issue. Um, and it's something that is not uh, fatal, but it, it was enough that the people that were looking at me were like, Oh, he's broken. Ugh. And, left. and so it was a really, I was talking to Paul about this one time where I was saying it was just really a dark night of the soul because it was such an identity crisis of, um, realizing that something you've spent your whole life training for and thinking like having everyone around you tell you that you're going to go play professional baseball. Uh, it was just such a depression that I started like smoking weed, drinking, hanging out with different kids. Like I've left hanging out with the athletes and I was hanging out with like the musicians and the stoners and, you know, doing that. And so eventually um, I just went through years and years of that. And I was, you know, there's, I don't share this a lot, but there was times where I remember drinking <clears throat> so excessively during that time where I would just, before I would go to sleep, I'm just like, I hope I don't wake up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I was like, it wasn't that I was trying to kill myself, but it was that I had given up on life. Yeah. You know, I, I was so depressed. So luckily music and art and poetry came into my life and it literally was a transformer to pick me up to see that there might be something else that I could, you know, learn and bring into the world a different type of energy. And so during that time, I really explored uh, painters like Jean-Michel Basquiat and Pollock and, you know, um, just so many different people. And I got into so much music and I was started playing in bands and touring and I ran a nonprofit after that for underserved kids, you know, music and art lessons. And we had a, it was called Homemade Genius. And um, <laughs> it's a funny story. One of my friends came in and I was in my living room, I was writing a poetry book and there was just poetry and pages everywhere. I had two or three paintings in my kitchen that I was painting at the same time. And I had a little music studio in my bedroom. I was in a one bedroom apartment, just, you know, single life. This was when I was like early 20s. And my friend came in and he was like, man, nobody knows that you're doing this. Like, you're, this is like a universe in here. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, he's like, man, you're a homemade genius. And like, it was just so funny. Like when I came up with the idea for the nonprofit, I like called him and I was like, hey, man, I think I'm going to use your name, Homemade Genius. That's a great name, right? So we, we used that name and he came and ran the nonprofit. We did it for nine years. And I learned this is really crucial because this is where I saw the transformation in children. When we started teaching them cello, violin, piano, guitar, bass, and drums, that was the teachers that we assembled. Um, and I started watching these kids from these underserved communities come in 
they were changing emotionally. They were changing, changing social status. Like they came in very quiet and reserved. And then halfway through, I started seeing kids that were getting cocky. They were getting excited mm-hmm. and confident and they were changing their emotional states. And I said, you know, there's something more here than just entertainment. Like th- this is literally changing these people's yeah. lives. What do you think was actually happening for the kids that obviously the the music was the common denominator, but like what was actually happening for them? Was the music healing them or providing therapy for them? Or was it the the playing of the instrument? Was it the the goal, the achievement? Like what do you what do you think? So I think that there was a couple things that were a part of that growth. I think, one, the teachers were really instructed to see the pupils that they were working with, you know, that it was like to encourage them when they put more effort into compromise and unity and to encourage them in learning and trying new things you know they were rewarded for trying new things like when the kids would come into the sessions they had options of the first thing they had to do was homework they did homework and they had their snack this was an after school program uh they they did their homework they did a snack and then they had the option do you want to do art today or do you want to do music and so they got to explore different instruments and they got to explore different media types for art And then after about a month and a half of those explorations, we said, okay, now you have to pick what are you going with? And so there was a decision making that had to take place. And, um, and I think that through all of that playing the instrument where they saw that something that seemed hard could be made easy over time. And then that they accomplished that. I think that goal of climbing that mountain and then having the therapeutic side of being able to express themselves through music. And one of the things that we did was we also had a in-house studio, like recording studio. So we recorded music. So we encouraged them to write music and we encouraged them to learn cover songs. And we would, you know, we made an album, a uh, compilation album of all the students and it was called We're All In This Together. And it was basically all of the kids writing their own songs. And we put that out in the community to bring more interest, you know, of people coming to support the program. So, yeah, so that was like really the first defining moment where I said, you know, there's something more to music than just entertainment. Please continue with with your your story and your journey. (laughs) Yeah. So shortly after that, um, running that program, well, you know, it was like almost 10 years. And so when I stopped that, I think I went through another identity crisis, you know, of like, what am I supposed to do now? And I think it was so severe that um, I fell ill because one, during that nonprofit, how you guys were talking about going to Egypt and the way that process was, was pretty much the way my life was um, during that time. I was on tour with my band. Sometimes we would go on tour for a month or two months at a time. And I was running the nonprofit from a phone while I was on the road. And then I was also coming back to running summer camps and all kinds of stuff with kids. And then we had touring national acts that would come to play so that we'd have ticket prices to support the work that we were doing. So it was a lot of moving parts that was doing it. And I did not, I was constantly giving to other people. I never gave back to myself. And so I felt ill and it was just a really great example. At the time, I didn't realize what was happening. At the time, I was like, why is this happening to me? I do so much, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, that ego came out and was, uh, you know, just frustrated of why I was falling ill. But the the illness ultimately got diagnosed um, by different specialists. And, uh, you know, I had two diagnoses. One was MS and the other was colon cancer. And so it was really a real scary moment for me where I was like, all right, I'm going to die. Like that's, that's like, I was like wrapping my head around um, this whole process, but there was something in me that just felt like I wasn't done. Like I, I love creating, you know, poetry, music and art. And I want to leave behind a lot of things because of just this, this bookshelf back here, there's tons of people and I read Rumi and Havez and all these Sufi poets. And I think about, they wrote this stuff, you know, hundreds of years ago and never knew that I was going to be a consumer 
of that. And I think it's such a fascinating thing. Like, um, uh, my partner has some, has young children and her kids are eight and 10. And yesterday we pulled out a bunch of albums and we're going through like CDs and they're like, wow, this is so cool. Like, like flipping through the books. And I was like, yeah, it's really a different experience, you know? Yeah. And like one of the CDs they pulled out was the ink spots and it's like an old, you know, singer songwriter. I mean, like a vocal trio uh, of people and they sing these amazing songs and they're just really pretty and I put put it on for them to listen to and they were just like so taken because it's like so far removed from their generation of like you know this type of music and so I was just thinking like how much all these people have given beyond their life like I, I on spotify when they were listening to the track i saw that it had 74 million streams and these people aren't alive anymore mm -hmm. and they're still their music is still being pushed out and so like during that time period i was realizing like i want to be a part of giving back to the world my gifts just like all these gifts have inspired me to want to do this for other people and so I knew that I wasn't done and so I just started immediately being drawn to Louise Hay uh, You Can Heal Your Life the book mm -hmm. mm. and also um, Dr. Mitchell Gaynor uh, wrote a book called The Healing Power of Sound and those books were so powerful and so profound. They like hit at exactly the time that I needed them to. And I just immersed myself fully into breath work, meditation and sound healing. And I had never really, I've always been a musician, but I had never done that before. And so I was severely overweight from leaving sports. I was just so depressed and I would eat my feelings. It was just such a, um, a hard time and so I was up to 320 pounds I was a, a you know pretty pretty big guy and so over the next year year and a half I started really devoting myself daily to the breath work the meditation and the sound healing and to be honest I could not meditate I couldn't sit still I didn't know how to do it and the music is what really ultimately helped me find that peace and when I found that piece, I found the meditation and through that breath work, meditation and sound healing a year and a half in, I'd lost 110 pounds about. Wow. And so it started and I what people would say, well, what are you doing? Are you exercising? I said, no. And they said, are you eating yeah. differently? I was like, kind of. And they're like, well, what's doing it? And I said, I think it was grief. I think I was holding on to so much energetic energy like guilt and fear and abandonment and anger and hurt. And, you know, it was just things that were low level vibrations. And I put on this padding and some of it was food, but I think a lot of it was just energetic, stagnant energy that was in my body. And so, um, I started learning food combinations. I got into more healthy options and, you know, just recently started and, and from the encouragement of Paul check, you know, I went to Paul check's house and hung out with him and I was watching him, do his workouts and he just he was like come on jump up here let's get on there he just yeah. he just started teaching me all this stuff and I started saying you know I feel better and I and since then I've just you know kept doing it so I'm I'm getting better and better each day stronger and stronger and I'm I'm happy and thankful for people like that being in my life but I mean honestly it's just been such a journey um I I'll finish this real quick by saying at the end of that, when I started losing so much weight, people would look at me and say, you know, Ian, what are you doing? And I was like, um, you know, music. And they're like, well, what kind of music? And I'm like, frequencies, man. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, just totally blowing them away by like people that were not into that stuff at all. So when I started getting into that, some yoga studios started asking me to bring my music and so I started doing that and it just grew like to holistic centers. I did a unity church and it just kept growing and growing. And then people from Australia and different parts saw the events on Facebook and started saying like, hey, let me help you uh, get your music over in Australia. I want people to hear this. I love your music. And um, the, the part I left out is when I got sick, uh, I went through a really hard time financially. Um, it was probably almost two years of, of being sick in that state and um, $60,000 in doctor bills and um, I got evicted from my house and I ended up being homeless and I started this company seven years ago like um, on a laptop like 
in a, in a homeless state, just dreaming of like, how could I utilize my skills for music for the greater good, but also supporting myself in the same fashion, being supported by your passion and your mission. And so it was a slow process, but we started growing. Um, now we're in nine different countries. Uh, we are working with you know practitioners all over the world, and um, Paul Check and his community have been huge, you know, and um, opening new doors and new opportunities, and just embracing what we're doing. And it's just been such a um, amazing journey um, to come from through all of that. And I think it's one of the reasons that I'm able to work with people is because a lot of the people who are coming to me have either been in similar states or something very close to things that I've gone through. And so you're able to hold space for them in a way uh, that has a little more experience than they do and to be a, a little more confident, like, hey, you're going to get through this, you're going to be fine. Um, and here's some tools and here's some things that's helped me, maybe it'll help you, you know? And so yeah. it's neat to be in a position. Absolutely, man. Wow. Th thank you so much for that share. It's It's... <sighs> I'm almost speechless. I know. It's such a beautiful story. <laughs> I'm going to plug it here and, and, and we'll continue to plug it throughout the show. But um, for anyone who wants to pause and just take a listen to some of these, uh, some of these songs and some of the offerings, it's listen to smile.com, right? I got that, got that right. Yes. Yeah. Smile.com. And there's a host of different uh, categorical sort of sound healing uh, samples that you can listen to. And so if you want context, you know, put a pause on the episode right now. Um, go take a listen because it's it's beautiful and it'll give you a little context for some of the things that we were talking about. You know, as you're as you're talking about your journey and as you talk about, you know, sound and, and how critically important it is to to your life and your story, but but also something that can be shared to others. Um, you know, a question that I'm curious about is how you define God or divinity and then how that relates to sound and, and vibration and kind of this this space and passion that you found yourself in yeah <clears throat> so this is an interesting topic so i um grew up in the church church of god um and was my mom really encouraged us to go to church i think 14 is when i stopped going to church i just started really having my mom told me that i was like one of her most defiant children um that <laughs> that at like six and seven years old, I was like, well, if God created Jesus, then who created God? And like mom's, yeah, like, yeah. you know, and so, and she was just like, you were asking all these questions that I didn't really have answers to. And it's funny now as a mature adult, I like talk to my mom and we have these very similar conversations because she's still in Christianity, but my uncle, who is her younger brother, um, is very new age. Like he's the one that got me into the Ascended Masters and a lot of, like the Flower of Life books one and two from Drumbelow. And yep. he got me into a lot of stuff when I was like very young, like, you know, 19, 20 years old, like turning me on to this stuff. And so uh, these conversations, um, I was talking to my mom and I said, Mom, I really want you to read some of the Gnostic texts and talk to me about some of the lost chapters of the Bible, because I think there was a lot of um, suppression and um, censorship that went into creating this text that people rely so heavily on. And I said, I'm not taking anything from the Bible. I think everyone can find some sort of truth and connection to the Bible, but I think there's so much more. And so like to answer your question, I would say, I grew up with this very narrow box of what God is and what spirit is. And I think that over the last 20, 25 years, I've really explored like the isms, you know, Sufism, Buddhism, all these different uh, belief systems and structures. And um, um, I was really taken by prayer. I was really taken by the story of Martin Luther um, where you know, the lightning struck the puddle right in front of him and could have killed him if he'd taken one more step. And he, you know, gave gratitude and prayer to God for sparing his life. And he said, I'll devote myself to following you now. And there was all these stories of the monasteries that he was in and practicing in where the brothers would say that he would be in his room cursing God, you know, like, F you God, and like just totally pissed off and like yelling and having these really, you know, crazy confrontations with God. And then the next day he would be out smiling, doing his chores, doing all the, you know, helping. 
and and doing the work right but then every night he would go back and have these cursings at god and just like so and that duality i think is always frowned upon in the spiritual community as well as like just in in general for mental health and well-being that if you're healthy you're you're happy all the time and i think that it's so interesting that my studies and explorations in religion brought me to a place of realizing like it's okay to be angry and it's okay to have days where you have a short fuse, but it's like the spirituality or the, uh, the, the, the lesson that's in those points is like, can you grow from this? Can you learn from this experience and utilize it to become a better person than you were yesterday? And I think that that became my religion and ultimately looking at it is that I do believe in a creator. I think there's too much mathematical code and too much uh, constructs that are here that work so seamlessly and beautifully that there's not some kind of creator. But I think I gave up long ago, you know, the last 15, 10, 15 years on trying to put that label on what spirit and creator is. And through experiences like journeying, uh, and, and plant medicine, um, I feel like I had these experiences that brought me closer, not only to my higher self, but to this collective energy spirit that I feel like, you know, some people would say like, is the matrix or, you know, whatever this, this construct is around us, but that kind of shed that veil or gave some shallowness or some, you know, see-through translucency, <laughs> you know, yeah. to through that process. And I think like, I realized that in those moments of that connection, that everything is love. Like when I was going through that dark night of the soul, it was really love that was uncomfortable and hard for me to deal with because I had a perception of what flow state was or what thriving or what being successful was. Um, and so these changes in that, um, relationship in my life I think really helped me to see that everything is love and that God is love and that creator is love um, and that I'm more open than I think I've ever been to what that looks like um, just saying like I'm okay not knowing like yeah. I'm like you yeah. know what I mean like I don't know you know yeah. there's so, freedom in it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah I think like it's really neat everybody needs something different. Some people need constructs and some people need structure. Some people need free flow and spontaneity, you know, to, to find that connection with spirit. But I think it's so great. It's like, if you think music as spirit, like look at all the different styles of music and ways that the creator can connect with people uh, in that state. You know, I remember, I don't know if you saw the Paul interview, but I think I was telling Paul that I have some friends that like that meditate to metal music, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, who am I to judge? You know, it's right. like uh, whatever works for you, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny yeah. in, in my own, we, we similarly, we come from Christianity. It's, we were born and bred in the evangelical church. And, um, I left Christianity in my early twenties through college and went kind of the route of scientific materialism for quite some time. And, but even in, uh, in my reflections on, on Christianity at large, there were so many spaces that I could point to as being um, contradictory or, you know, my, my terminology, foolish or ridiculous to consider absolute. Yet I would look at the worship session mm -hmm. of church or we went to a Christian school and it was chapel once a week. And one, I remember feeling the freaking flow of synchronized singing and alignment and oneness in these, these musical sessions that were taking place in Christianity. This thing that I had come to realize was, was not serving me, potentially not real in any way. Yet I kept saying like, you know what? These motherfuckers have something right because <laughs> these worship sessions are filled with a godlike energy there's a metaphysical energy inside of this and um it's funny because it's it's the relationship to sound as kind of the one for me saving grace or the one chord of resonance within the the structure of the religion itself that rings true through 
through accessing divinity. And so it's like, okay, well, there's the worship part, at least, that feels really good. And the more I've learned about the the real history of Christianity, the mystical Christians that were kind of the 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 ones who birthed this this religion, it was very ceremonial. It was very, very uh, ritualistic in the way that they would engage with sound and uh, substances, and it would it would conjure up this metaphysical experience that they articulated as as God. And um, yeah. in, my, in my own reflection through all this, I'm like, wow, so much of this is based in sound, sound healing, um, sound as the access to God, and mm-hmm. and and unifying a group of people, oneness, yeah. 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 I think I'll just say this real quick. Uh, I read the Nag Hammadi text. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, <laughs> but um, yeah. So there's a book called Eden uh, that you can look up. It's just called Eden. And then there's another, the book, the Nag Hammadi text. And it's very similar. Nag Hammadi and the Dead Sea Scrolls are closely related, just different, um, you know, viewpoints i guess but my the the thing that's really interesting to me is that there's a part in the book and my mother and i talk about this quite a bit with her being still in christianity and i asked mom i said mom what if you found out that god was a woman and i said how would that make you feel and and we talked about that and then i was like now what if i said god was a woman and she gave birth to this universe from a dream that she had And from that dream, she stood back just like us creating a painting, right? Like we create these paintings and, you know, we'll stand back and like, oh, I could have done this better or I could have done this or whatever. And I said, and she stood back and she had a moment of doubt about what she created. And in that moment of doubt, the devil was created, was born, was spawned from that energy. And then I said, let's say that God, the woman, left this realm, you know, she went back to her, her now reality moment and the devil took over and dressed himself as God. And that's what we've been worshiping this whole time. And so my mom's like, that's blasphemous. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. And so like, and so like, I was like, but just ponder this, like, what if, what if that happened? And then I said, look at um, the Vatican and a lot of the issues that You know, and I was like going into like, I was like, mom, you know, the Vatican has a telescope named Lucifer. And I was like, do you find that odd? And I was like, do you know, there's sculptures and and statues that are in the Vatican. They're very highly demonic. And I was like, you know, it, it would kind of like when you start looking below the surface, this ideal just, you know, that I'm pondering with her could maybe have some truth into it. And so I said, My question to you is, let's just ponder, what if this is true? And then how would that make you feel about what you've invested time and energy into in this moment? And I said, would you feel like that you lost out on things or that you were duped? Or do you feel like you still have a connection to spirit because something that you're worshiping is far more than these ideals or this picture, you know, cause I was like talking to her, what would Jesus really look like? He wouldn't be a white man with a beard, right? If he was from that area of the world. Right. So it was like really pondering and like breaking down these things. And now my mom is actually like, I got her to read a Joe Dispenza book. We had this thing where she was like, I'll read something you give me. I'll read something. Nice. And then I would read oh, something cool. she gave me. So I read a Joel, a Joel. Yeah. So I read Joel Olstein and then oh she read God. Joe Dispenza. <laughs> And so, and so, so, so it's just, it's really interesting, the conversations that are had. And I um, talk about this quite frequently. If, if we as people could learn how to, before we pass judgments or criticize uh, criticisms and, and talking to people about things that we want to inspire them on, if we could get on their level, communicate and talk to them on a friendship basis about what it is that they're into and then metaphorically relate that same thing to the things that we're looking at. I think we find more common ground. We find more breakthroughs. And there's things where I realized the reason I'm telling the story is to say, I realized there was things in Christianity that I could still gain something from and let that ego go, those walls come down. And then there was something that my mom found in Joe Dispenza. She started watching Joe Dispenza videos on YouTube now where she's like 
getting into his work and it's expanding her horizons, it's also expanded our relationship where we have these very deep talks about things that I don't think we would have been able to do before. And I think bringing this all back to the music, I feel like the music is doing that, the frequencies. Like when you introduce music to people, it doesn't matter if it's in a different uh, uh, religious sect or if it's from a different um, uh, country where they don't speak the language. The music can still move people because music is a universal mathematical equation you know that's being put out and people are inspired and moved emotionally from this beautiful magic you know that music can be and you know i i find that art and music and poetry and dance are so liberating and so powerful for self-expression but also deep healing yeah well put it, wow, it, I love that. it bypasses the mask. It bypasses the shield of the ego that we put out there. And I think with that kind of universally connects mm -hmm. all of us. And and it kind of leads me to my next question and, and topic of conversation, which would be uh, you mentioned the use of such healing sound um, in journeys and, and in psychedelic experiences or ceremonial settings like breath work. Um, let's go into that a little bit because I think it's more important than ever to talk about this in a long form way as psychedelics become more and more transactional as they hit the mainstream and as people are, you know, quickly finding options of having a psychedelic experience in a transactional way as many of us would in the Western world where we can literally book a session on an app, go in and get a shaman you know, two hour ceremony at the local strip mall from Brett, the shaman who got his license two weeks ago and get in and out, have a psychedelic journey. And then that's it. But I think there yeah. are some ways in this sort of set and setting idea uh, to do these things in, in a way that pays reverence and, and keeps, keeps such practices sacred. And I think sound is one of those. So maybe you can go into a little bit, um, you know, what that looks like for you and from your perspective as, as far as how sound plays a critical role in the psychedelic journey uh, experience. Well, I remember the first time that I smoked weed when I was in high school. And I just want to say this experience is I was listening to Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. right? And I put on the headphones and I had listened to the album before, but I had never um, listened under any influence of anything. And uh, when I put on the headphones, I think I got lost for like hours. You know, like I was mesmerized by the way that my body felt the music and I was mesmerized by the state of being that I was in and I was able to focus and take in the music in a far different way and the first time I did mushrooms um, I remember music was such a huge part of that um, journey and it was with four of my friends in high school and we did a ceremony like we we wanted to there was a lot of change was happening with a lot of us you know at that time and there was a lot of people moving and leaving and there was a lot of change in our town and I think it was just a really heavy energy we were in a small town there wasn't a lot of stuff to do but my friend made this playlist a mixtape you know a mixtape guys yeah. <laughs> taking it back Right. A mixed tape. He made these these four cassette tapes that were just mixed tapes, and we listened to them the entire day. And it literally was so transformative. I don't remember talking to anyone the whole time. It was just completely focused on a lot of the visuals and a lot of the experiences going on in my body and um and the music. The music was so crucial and like he had mapped it out to where he knew you know 45 minutes of just like getting set up for everything and you know we went through uh i guess three different phases and i remember thinking like how like later on when i was seeing how other people in that you know in that age group were like um, using psychedelics, it was a lot different than what we had done in that environment. And so as I, you know, shifted and got older and started going on these journeys, you know, in my forties, I started realizing how important it is to really set an intention and do a ceremony, speak it out loud, uh, you know, before starting and really, um, do some breath work and energy clearing before the session starts. And, 
and really having, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is looking at it as a movie, like you're creating a script, you've got the script and it's going to go off script, you know, it's inevitable, it's going to happen, but you're going to somewhat stick to this plot. And then this movie soundtrack that you're creating for this journey is just like, I was talking to someone, I said, go to your favorite blockbuster movie, the most epic action point, turn the volume down. See if you have the same experience and I don't mean just the sound effects, like take the music out and see if it's even close to what you think the epicness is of that part of the movie. And so I'll, I really relate this to people's wellness journey, whether they're working out and doing things in the gym or whether they're trying to motivate themselves to eat differently or they're actually going for deep release and healing and like work with medicine. I think it's all very similar. There's soundtracks that are involved in these processes that can like really aid you know, um, like if Rocky's running up the steps and, you know, and they're doing the video montage of him working out to do the big fight, there's music that's really pumping you up and really making that accentuated more than it would be if it was just him running up the steps, you know? So like we can take these soundtracks and these playlists that we put together to really accentuate these journeys and to go deeper and to really connect at a different level um, than we previously have. And I feel like a lot of the medicines are very specific and, and like have different energies. Like um, mushrooms for me, I feel like I'm very contemplative and meditative and feel very chill. When you do acid, I feel like I really want to like move, like walk and go and see and like do, <laughs> do things. And like, you know, um, when, like ketamine, we were talking about that earlier before, is like, I, it was such a different experience for me where uh, you're highly sensitive to sound. So like gongs and like singing bowls, you know, uh, they're too much. Like they're just, they're too much. And I think like um, having some very soft and very, um, you know, soundscapes that are very chill, no drums, like just very subtle and um, very sensitive, you know, energies and that. And I feel like it's, it's um, it almost felt like a very, um, ethereal you know vibe with with ketamine so like i feel like having someone that has experienced the medicine that you're using and then having someone that is familiar with like uh flow charts like for instance creating a yoga playlist like there's you know light flow yoga and then there's like restorative and yin yoga and like things that get into more and, and those playlists would be very different. And I think plant medicines should be viewed the same way and really worked with in a way that um, is uh, intentional based, you know, with the group that you're working with. And um, so, yeah, I think that music is a huge, huge part of this that a lot of people leave out completely, you know? Yeah. 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 yeah it's so true. I love that you're how, how deep you're going into this because um, I know from experiences that I've had that we've had any certain type of plant medicine, even just breath work, yeah. your field, for for lack of a better word, your essence is completely just wide open. And it's, which is beautiful. That's, that's how we receive downloads and noetic, you know, pieces of information and how we can uh, shift and absorb. But it's also, it can be jarring with your essence completely open, your field completely open when something that is harsh or too loud or too, just it's not a matching resonance to what what's going on in here. It can be really jarring. And I think that um, you know, someone who maybe might indulge in mushrooms or LSD or something before, say, going to like a rock concert, maybe it's a great experience, but it also could be an awful experience because you're so open and it might not be the right frequency match with that specific medicine that's interacting with your body, your vessel. Um, yeah. so I, I I love that you have a, a sense of each of those individual medicines and uh, what would be a good match with that. I think that that is absolutely critical. Yeah. It's almost like yeah. you're, you're laying on the operating table completely yeah. cut wide open. Yeah. And uh, 
if you don't know who's coming to operate on you, you know, the music can literally be the the operating hands of the experience for you in this case when you're energetically sitting there just vulnerable and mm-hmm. filleted open. Um, what are some what's some of the feedback that you've heard from people who have specifically used um, some of your sound healing mechanisms, playlists, albums um, for their own life? Would love to hear maybe some some examples of people who've been who've been applying these. Yeah. So a lot of people, <laughs> I just had a guy, so um, one, a lot of the music that we release is only available exclusively to the members and affiliate program that we use. So we have some albums in our wellness series that are, you know, available to the public for personal use. And we have the member program where they get write-ups about, so before I go into this, I'll make this real quick. The, we make an album each month that's based on the astrology. So we look at, we, we just recently changed to Vedic from Western. And I believe that Western is like the, like if you look at a cello, it has the big tuning pegs at the top. And then it has the fine tuners on the bridge, like the little wheels that you turn. And so Vedic astrology to me is the fine tuners. Mm. The big tuners are Western astrology. I think both of them are effective. I think when they're utilized together, it can be highly effective. Um, but I really believe that Vedic astrology is very fine-tuned, very detailed, and very um, complicated compared to Western astrology. But we switched this year to using Vedic astrology. So we got a, a resident Vedic astrologer, um, Tulsi, who is just masterful. We sat down with her. We did a year overview of the year of like what each month looks like. And then we broke down what does this look like for alleviating some of the denser energies and accentuating some of the more playful energies to for the collective. So we make an album that has a few movement tracks on it and it has four or five meditation tracks on it and it just gives people something to work with each month that's in that theme for the month. And so uh, recently one of our affiliates said that he took a journey on the music and the music that he picked was very, <laughs> it, it was a, uh, we experiment with sounds, you know, so we're trying to give people what they want, but also pull them into experimenting with sound. So a lot of people on this month, this past, this was, um, yeah, this was last month. It, it, there's a track on the album that has hand drums. It's like five or six hand drums. It's very tribal kind of, uh, shamanic, you know, in the beat, but all of the instruments on top have tuned cellos, violas, and violins that are in the sacred frequency. And so it's very uh, cinematic. And, and, the, and so a lot of people said it reminded them of music from like the Vikings TV show. Mm. I, I, haven't, I haven't watched it, but um, and so it has about seven or eight parts or what you would call movements and like neoclassical type of stuff. And it's, it's, I was experimenting like to see what people really thought about experimenting with sound of like, what do you consider meditative music and experimenting with different instruments that wouldn't typically be seen in a shamanic drumming track, you know, like that. And so um, he said that it was like this transformative experience where he just put the song it was an eight minute song. He put it on repeat and listened to it the whole time. And he was talking about the different phases and what it made him feel in his body. And he said it was so much different than like, regular tuned music like he was saying as soon as the bass hit he could feel it in his body in a way that he knew and he's a musician himself like he plays music and so i I felt really um honored to get his critique and comments and he was just basically saying that it was very powerful and transformative and that he wanted to get more of the music because he you know just got and uh introduced into the music uh, recently, and so he was saying, "I want to get more of this and dive deeper into this stuff, and to get more into uh, this type of frequency music for this." Like he's really big into journeying, and just said that it made the process so much deeper for him. And so I hear that a lot from a lot of different people, but I think most of it is the surprise of like, you know, I've listened to mainstream music, but they were like, with this being so intentional in the way that you set up the albums, where it has about like it starts at somewhere between 190 beats per minute, you know, 100 or 90 beats around that as a starting point. And then as the album goes, each track starts downshifting in beats per minute. So like at the last part of the album, it might be at about 30 beats per minute, which is extremely slow. <laughs> and it really chills people out to the point where they either fall asleep or they go into this deep 
meditative experience. And I think it's sort of just dropping people in or expecting them to be there. It's like you take them on this, mm. this journey. So like if you, um, as a group, set the intention and then as a group say, you know, this is kind of like at 10 minutes, we want this at an hour, we want this, it, you know, so you set up these markers for your journey and you make the music mix accordingly. And it's just so powerful. It's so powerful in what it aids in those tools. Mm, wow. I love that so much. Awesome. We are sprinting to your website after this and signing up for your <laughs> membership 150%. Um, but I want to, I want to, you know, pull on the thread a little bit of your creative process. Um, are you channeling when you create this music? What's going on? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> so my partner just recently started working with me. She's a, she is really awesome and powerful in light language and she plays piano and she's classically trained music. And this is so funny. A lot of, I, I should, probably should have said this earlier, um, people are like, what key are you playing in? And I'm like, I have no idea. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, they're, I'm like, I know scales, I know chords, but I don't even think of music in that way. And they're like, what do you mean? And they're like, but I'm playing this and you're down and you just start playing. And I'm like, I know what the notes sound like. And I just feel, I feel it. I don't really yeah. experience music on a theory base, you know? Wow. Yeah. And cool. so, um, so when so we were doing our first album together this past uh, two months ago when she started really coming in in the studio and like working with me, um, I'm learning from her. She's teaching me music theory, and then I'm teaching her why sometimes music theory can just be thrown out the window and it doesn't really matter. And like we were going through this process, and she was like, "Man." Um, the way that you do the music, she's like, you go into this meditation, but I thought it was just going to be like a long time. It was going to be like this long meditation. You're going to do all this stuff before you started recording. And she's like, you just write all this stuff and it just happens so fast and so quick. And I was telling her this story about Greg Braden, where he was talking about um, a rainmaker and he was going, getting to go to this in uh, Sedona, go to see this guy create the ceremony to make the rain. And so in, his, in this interview, Greg Braden was saying that he was so pumped. He was like, I'm going to see this ceremony. It's going to be so awesome. <laughs> and he said he got to the place and the guy had a pickup truck, like an old beat up pickup truck. And he said, hey, get in the truck. And he was like, all right. So they got in the truck and they drove to the top of the mountain. They got out and the guy walked over to the, the edge of the cliff and he bowed his head for like a minute and he lifted his head and he said, all right, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so um i started laughing because i thought it was hilarious because i know what it's like to build up this anticipation and have this like um experience where you have these expectations of something being some elaborate production and it's not and like i was telling her that in the interview he said within three or four minutes it started raining right after they left like they're driving away and the rain starts falling on the on the on the windshield and i was telling uh, my partner uh, Brittany, i said um when i first started this seven years ago i found it so challenging i was so stressed about making an album every single month because i would like write record it i mix it and master it all myself so it's a long process for a month and i, I was finding it really challenging and at a certain point i just let go like i let go of trying to control it and i started just telling spirit in that meditation i would say use me as your vessel bring through what is needed for the collective i need help and assistance and i would say god is the only power acting here and i would just say that over and over god is the only awesome. power acting mm, i love that and so, and so whenever I would start recording, yeah, I would just find this flow state. And I got to a point where I was even like, even if there was things I wanted to change and make perfect, because I'm such a perfectionist, I, I uh, would be doing it like two or three days before the album would come out. And people would be like, man, I'm so stressed. You're going to, you know, and I'm like, it's all good. Like, it's all good. I feel peace. And it was such, it, it took me seven years to get to that point, you know, of, of getting to a point of being at ease and also realizing I didn't have to put on some elaborate theatrical production that I could connect with spirit directly and, um, and do it in a minimal way that had maximum impact. You know, it didn't have to be this theatrical thing. And so, um, for me, like most of the time I do some, I, um, 
have come up with this product that's a frequency spray 528 and it's called um frequency foundations and it's basically we spray this spray be like saging it's it's water that's infused with 528 hertz and then it has some different um like rose water and different uh essential oils that are in there and so i spray that in my room uh before i start you know the session and then i basically go into some breath work and meditation probably 20 minutes you know of of before i start creating a re-album and then throughout the month as i start you know, reworking on things or reworking that, that music, I do the same type of, you know, thing. And so, um, I feel like it's very effective for me, you know, everybody's different and, and how they do it, but I feel like it's very effective for me. And it's something that took seven years, but now I'm able to create on command and be in a, a flow state, like turning it on and off, like a light switch where it, you know, in the beginning, it was not that way. It was very stressful. And I felt like it was really pushing and like, but I had to learn to co-create with spirit. And so it became a co-creation process instead of me trying to take credit for the whole thing, you know, and like be in control and like, um, be responsible <laughs> for, yeah. for, you know, everyone's connection to it. So I think a lot of artists and creatives can relate to that. You might strike gold, um, with a creative idea or a creative concept or a project and then look to recreate that through systems and through protocols and a very rational approach to trying to recapture the magic, if you will. And, and oddly enough, it is that sort of surrendering to um, the, the and it's a, it's a feminine energy. It's a creative say, that's energy. That's the feminine. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a surrendering act to channeling. And and um, I, think, I think so many people can resonate with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's like, it's the feminine, it's the feminine, you know, flow. I, I feel like, um, I grew up with three sisters. So I also, um, have had these meetings in business with different people and you'll be with like alpha male energy. That's like very dominating in the room and very like, um, bossy, uh, you know, putting out all their opinions and, projecting things. And I've been in business meetings where we leave the business meeting and some of the people that work with me will say like, um, I feel like you have a really dominant energy sometimes, but you didn't say anything. And I said, I didn't have to say anything. And they're like, why? And I was like, I'm going to save it for the next meeting. And they're like, but what if they, you know, don't uh, go with us or do this or, you know, like there was an expectation on their part. And I said, like, whatever is meant for us is going to happen, whether we try to mess it up or not, you know what I mean? Or like we do something wrong or say something wrong. Number one, I've learned that. But number two, I realized like how much feminine energy is a part of the healing process because there's a surrender and a nurturing that has to take place internally for those real massive movements of trauma and, and, um, anger even you know like to move so that you can actually get to the root of like what is going on in that person and I think like that nurturing energy I really look back on my childhood at growing up with three sisters and also a, my mom is a very strong woman she's been through a lot of things in her lifetime and I think a lot of the things that I went through in my lifetime were generational traumas that I had to, you know, kind of put work into to to get through. But my point is, is just saying, like, I think a lot of healing work is done by surrender and it's done by the nurturing of mm -hmm. self. And it's like to be like, OK, and crying to be OK and um, saying, you know, I messed up and that's OK. But now what's what's the work to move forward or i treated people badly i hurt people i did i did and said wrong things you know and forgiving yourself nurturing yourself and also taking responsibility for what has happened in that time because you know in my in my youth i was a very angry person i went through a lot of stuff in my lifetime um, that I didn't have the tools to process and I didn't even really understand what was going on with me in those time periods. And so I did and said a lot of things to people that I wish I could take back. And there was things that I had to come to terms with and nurturing and healing myself to say like, 
you did the best you could with what you had at the time. And you might have been in your ego more than you should have been, or you might have been uh, arrogant, or you know, you know, you might have been an asshole to people. And that's okay. Like you are forgiving yourself, you're acknowledging it, but like now what do we do to change to get better? And I think that now what thing is is a very feminine energy of like because if if you look at a man in a time of crisis and i'm not saying this like everyone across the board i'm just saying typically right you see a man in a in a process that he's really frustrated like putting something together a lot of times we're going to throw our hands up and be like you know f this you know (laughs) it's like just be so so mad but a woman will look at it and be like well if this doesn't work what if we take it all apart, flip it around backwards, and we do this? Like, that might work, right? And then you're just like, yeah, okay, all right, it might work, you know? <laughs> it's like, so, but my point is, is I think, like, there is a, a balance. Like, when we're talking about, you know, the divine masculine, the divine feminine, we're really talking about a balancing of these energies. And I think in, in men, if you see more feminine qualities uh, in these, like, nurturing or compassion or crying at something that's moving it's like you know you're taught that you're a pussy or you're not strong or this is weakness and i think like i just want the reason why i'm saying this is i think like in music i've had this conversation with a lot of masculine men in my life i would say guys to be corn or the deaf tones or helmet or a tool i said it's so easy to get on stage and play in front of millions of people with distortion and rage and like this rock but i said take one of those musicians put an acoustic guitar in their hand and have them write a song of their soul and bear witness to these millions of people and i said it takes far more strength to be vulnerable than it does to be tough yeah. you know what i'm saying <clears throat> so much more strength that you need to be vulnerable like to cry in front of someone right than it is to like yell at someone right so i think like there's such a a gift in this time period that we're witnessing this healing of the masculine and feminine uh and and the balance there's a lot of masculine energy in women and and like i've had these conversations and in sessions where i'm working with women from like divorce and they'll be like, well, I'm a single mom now, so I have to be this. I have to be both sides. And I said, but do you? Do you have to be both sides? Can you be you and still show up for your children the way that they do? Because a lot of the things that you're complaining about in your life, you're also associating with this masculine energy because you're bitter about it. You don't want to do this, and you're doing it, and you feel like you have to do it. And through that, it's even taking that process to a different perspective than even what you think you're delivering in that energy. Right. So I think like, it's just really interesting to look at the time of like how there is a masculine energy that is changing, that is becoming more nurturing to women in this state saying like, Hey, you can, I'm here. You can put this down. You don't have to carry this this way. Right. And I think there's a lot of women that are coming to the realization of men have had a hard life <laughs> you know it's like you get shots like rub dirt on it you know if you right. if something happens to you don't cry be tough and it's like we're never made to feel accepted in our vulnerability and to not be used against us at a later date right and so those expressions of feelings are how we're going to heal the masculinity so there's a space that the feminine feminine energy has to hold for that nurturing that they're wanting right that they want to take place they have to be a part of that process and so i think we're witnessing this really big transformation right now with masculine and feminine energy and i think all the plant medicines and the journeys that are coming in are so, so powerful. I watched this documentary about in 2012, it was about 2012. And there was a shaman in there that said the what happened in the sixties was that there was this huge explosion of psychedelic use, but there was no, um, elders. There was nobody to help people. Once they hit that, uh, like the opening and the expansion, there was no continuation of it because there was no elders to oversee the journey to the next realm, right? There, were, And so it just faded out. Sure. And that, when I heard him say that, I just was like, wow, that is so true. You know, like it's so true that there was not an expansion. And I think like podcasts like this and people that are writing books and putting it out, 
information about masculine and feminine, about opening to the divine, about expressing yourself and coming into a new understanding of self, it is so powerful. It's going to be the awakening of the planet, I think. Yeah, yeah per- perfectly so right. put, like beautifully articulated. I, I want to kind of take this and, and, and move it into uh, the next conversation point around the continuing evolution of technology and how sound will continue to play a part. Um, I think that there's been soul loss. There's been uh, certain losses as technology has progressed up to this point. We were even talking about to start the show, how kind of the transactional nature of consuming music through Spotify, it's almost separating the artist from the album. And I mean, we, we say it all the time, but like we refer to things that we're listening to not by the artist near as much as we used to because we're we're just not as intimate with the consumption of an album at a store or a record player but rather the compilation of playlists or shuffles um yeah. and so there's there's things that are lost with technology and as we're kind of on this sort of like the precipice of the the artificial intelligence movement i know you might harbor some some very specific thoughts you know arguably unpopular in the mainstream around AI and its interaction with music going into the future. Can you maybe shed some light on um, this, this, these energies that we've been talking about, the masculine, the feminine, the, the presence of the divine, the soul that's within a lot of the, the creations of artists like yourself, and how those continue on into the future despite something like artificial intelligence becoming more and more prevalent? Yeah. Um, so AI, I don't think is... Uh, a bad thing or the devil in the sense of tools that can assist humanity. I think there's going to be a lot of things that come great from AI. I think AI unfiltered and unchecked is a terrible thing, uh, in my opinion. You know, I think that there's a lot of potential for um, negative uh, things, <laughs> you know, in that situation. But but um, I utilize yeah. there's. Yeah, <laughs> there's some software tools that I utilize that uh, in music making that use AI technology, and they are very powerful and they are uh, of great assistance, you know. But where I think we're starting to cross the line already is I was telling you that there's some AI companies that are coming out that'll take a book already in creation and it'll just basically filter it, reword it, and then put it out. You can put it out as your own content. And I think. Not only is that unjust, but it's stealing from that original creator um, an idea and a concept. And I think that uniqueness and soul and ideas and concepts are very powerful things in the creation of art, you know, because you're essentially dabbling in magic. You know, if you guys are familiar with Alan Moore, um, you know, he's a comic book writer, graphic novelist, um, visual artist, a uh, very amazing person. The Watchman, if you guys are familiar yep. with. Yeah, yeah. So if you listen to him talk about creativity as magic, it's, it's you know, there's no word for it. It's magical. It's like it, you get really taken away by his viewpoints and perspectives on the creation of something from nothing. And like he talks about the power of the creators and how we've lost that, that it's essentially being utilized as a w- form of witchcraft in propaganda and in advertisements. And he was saying that we're not really utilizing this magic in a way that could really transform the world uh, on a soul level. And so I think what, like at listening to smile and other companies like us, I think what we're really focused on is relationships with the people we're working with and the environments that we're creating. So we are selling a product of music, but I think it's more than that. It's the music being utilized in these partnerships and relationships and the music being utilized in environments that are ideal for true change, you know, to, to take place. And so with AI coming in and writing music or writing content and things like that, I think it's highly helpful in some areas. But when you get into creativity for like art, music, poetry, and you're taking the human element out of it, there's a sense of magic that's lost, a sense of soul and the interaction with the creator and the, you know, 
the end user, you know, however you want to call that, the the person that's that's taking in that content. And I believe that on a soul level, people will feel that if they're intuitive in any way or have any way of feeling energy. I feel like people are going to feel the lifelessness in that. And so um, I just, I think it concerns me because we're already living in a society that is setting up templates, you know, that there, there's a template to make a million dollar song. There's a template to create a show in a certain way or make a movie in a certain way. And we're losing the ability to be unique and we're, we're not rewarding uniqueness at all. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, and so like when people ask me, they say like, what are some of your favorite bands? And I'm like the doors, Frank Zappa. And I, and they're like, why? And I said, because nobody sounds like them. Mm-hmm. Nobody like, someone that you're going to say they sound like the doors or they sound like, you know, Frank Zappa, like they're so unique and so different. And I listen to those, the music because when I'm listening to it, I have no idea what's coming next because they experimented and they tried new things. And we're in a society where that's frowned upon. If you're not creating a million dollar song, every album, then we throw you away. You know, and it's like there's so many things that our generation is losing because we're not investing in the creatives and the arts. And and you look at people like Joni Mitchell, James Taylor, you know, Paul McCartney, all these different people that they had a lot of albums that were not hits, but people didn't give up on them. And, you know, they've created masterful works that transform generations, you know, and so we're not investing in people anymore we're just investing in profits and it's it's something that we've slowly lost the edge you know um i look at america as this place that used to be the show the center ring you know we would we pushed out entertainment for the world and we're slowly losing that market because we've gotten away from art and we've moved into profit and i think it's starting to show yeah, I mean, you look at the, even just the the original IP and something like Hollywood, and and the amount of what actually gets greenlit for box office uh, promotion is is uh, sequels or comic books and and superheroes, mm-hmm. and it's a script. Stick to the script. This makes the most money. It's a almost pornographic showing of CGI to mm-hmm. to stimulate as much dopamine and pleasure chemicals as humanly possible from a visual experience or nothing you know storytelling yeah. um, is is in other channels if if any and, and I think we have enough examples of soulless or lifeless um templates you know we have food that's completely separated from from life itself and even though they hit on some of the same feedback mechanisms in the human body as that of real food they are missing sustenance they're missing uh depth and over the course of time it shows up in the human body um and i think you could say the same thing for even like the home right you buy a cookie cutter templated house and unless you really go to the act of of creating uh, your own experience or your own representation of yourself in that home um you can feel like you're just living in a box without sort of having something that is yours that you can define as home that represents you and your identity in some way and so i think we have enough examples in a lot of lanes in our life where we can see what happens when we separate life from the creative act or we separate soul from the creative act it it's shallow it might hit on some of the same you know feedback mechanisms that that humans have to such that we want to consume them but over the course of time they become somewhat lifeless what you just said reminds me mm-hmm. of a scene from the giver the movie the giver did you uh, see the book? so i highly suggest you guys see this movie okay, okay. Uh, i think it's a very spiritual movie it's called the giver it's got jeff bridges in it Okay. Um, so I love his acting. I think he he does a great job. Anyways, my point is he's walking with this kid, and the the premise of the movie is that all of society has started taking drugs to tune out emotions, and that all of society is controlled. That there's no they they turned it to where people have no they have no vision of color. Everything's black and white. So Jeff Bridges they call the giver. And so he sets at the edge of society 
and he's the only one that can see color, and he's the only one that has memories of the past. And so whenever they get into a struggle, they consult him as an oracle mm. to make decisions. So the movie picks up. I'm not going to give a lot away. Basically, they, they get a kid who's going to go into training to become the next giver. So he's teaching the kid how to be like him and to experience all this stuff. And he's talking to the kid and he touches him and he's giving him visions of the past. Mm. And so the kid and him are walking. He's walking the kid back to his house because each day he has to come to his house to learn. So he's walking the kid back to the house and he says, um, he says, teacher, these houses that because they don't have houses in the future, they call them dwellings. Mm. So the guy, he says, these houses you showed me, it, he was like, it's like our dwellings. And he said, no, a home is much different than a dwelling. Mm. And he's like explaining like the environment of a home, the sanctuary, the energy of protection and security and love. And he's like trying to explain this to a kid that does not understand. And the whole movie is like this. It's amazing. Mm. It's such a spiritual movie. But um, anyways, it just reminds me a lot of like what you said. It's like so similar. And, um, you know, you can have a construct. Um, like, for instance, you can have someone who experiences death of a parent. And, the, and the, their friends never had their parents die and says, man, I'm, you know, I'm feeling really bad for you. I'm so sorry. But that person who's trying to convey that compassion will not truly know. They can know of, but they will not know what it feels like until that parent passes away. And I think like there's a lot of things that are coming with AI that's going to be like that. It's like teaching things that you have no experience of, you know? It's so true. It reminds me of the the difference between knowledge and wisdom you know you can you can read a book and you can learn you can acquire knowledge but until you put that knowledge into experience you have no wisdom and it, it sort of feels like ai is knowledge and true real human experience the magic of creativity and the creative flow process because it's really unlike any other um we we experience it in, in a variety of ways but i think uh for us even just through this podcast you know there is an energy to the creation of a podcast episode, a conversation with someone that we want to learn from. And there is this opening. Um, and it's really hard to explain unless you're you're in it. And that is part of the, the creative flow, the creative process, the magic that is created that we get to experience. And uh, I, I'm thinking about like, you know, 100 years into the future, AI, hopefully it doesn't turn out this way, but who knows? You know, are, are, is AI going to be creating podcast conversations where it's just yeah. thoughts going Probably. back and forth like yeah. that yeah. It, it could be yeah yeah well i don't know if you guys know or not but you know google has set up a religion around us worshiping ai they, they they're planning for that okay. yeah it's already Sick. being set into place okay. <laughs> what <laughs> Yeah, Gosh, I'm no, learning so much from this conversation. <laughs> oh no, thank you. Oh man, no, that does not 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 sound good. Ian, I, I know we've got a ton of people who are going to want to support you, um, listen to some of your work and, and some of the creativity that you've put out into this world. What's the best way that um, people can support you and some of the various offerings that you have, um, so that we can all be familiar enough to take immediate action? So we do have one album on Spotify just for people to sample. So you, you can go on Spotify for free, check out one of the, sh it's an older album, probably four or five years old. Uh, Shamanic Journey album is pretty cool. I still enjoy it. Um, and that's out there. Then we have a band camp where they can purchase some of the newer music that is out. Um, it's just listening to smile, the number one, listening to smile one dot bandcamp dot com. Um, and then uh, that's where they can purchase the wellness series that's used for personal use only. It's something that they would use at home. And then if they were wanting to use it in their business or a commercial space, um, they would sign on to the listening to smile.com. There's lots of information on the website. You can read through, um, learn more, but they can sign up for the membership program through there. So at the top, there's some um, services 
menu and you can click on the membership and the membership they get two free albums when they sign up and then they get an album every month inside the album there's also videos so we have astrology videos we have poetry we have music um, explanations about the music the frequencies what parts of the body they work with so it's like a really advanced uh you know, behind the curtain view of the process so they can utilize it personally. They can also share it in their community. Um, they can use it for podcast themes. They can use it for uh, videos on social media as long as credit's given to us. They can also host events that are ticketed, sound healing, sound baths, med guided meditations with the music. And then they're able to resell like any um, like newsletter or any kind of content like, hey, you know, we're part of this process. Here's our favorite song from this album. If you like this, you can purchase it here with our discount code. And so it's just it's a way that creates... Um, not only tools and, you know, uh, music that can accompany things they already have in place with their business, but it also creates new revenue streams for them uh, with that. And then it gives them the protection where they're able to utilize this music without threat of being sued or, you know, being um, like a video being pulled down, cause, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's just a way that they can sign up on there. Um, and then if they use medicine, as the code, then they'll get a 25% sale, uh, you know, awesome. uh, discount, sorry, discount <laughs> off of that. And then portions of that sale will go towards the podcast to support the work that you guys are doing as well. Wow, so thank you. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. Yeah. So awesome. Really Very cool. Yeah. We'll have uh, all the links and everything in the description box and show notes uh, for you guys. So just scroll down and check that out. We are absolutely I, I'm super fired up to yeah. have this conversation and mm -hmm. to learn from you and to now go from here and and support you with our our money energetics too and, and to receive that gift and just knowing where it's coming from, the creative process and everything. It just adds so much color to everything that we will receive from you now in the form of music, knowing your backstory, knowing what has gone into it, knowing the trials and the catalysts that you had to go through to create this gift to the world. It's just like, man, it's, it's really meaningful. And I haven't even signed up yet, but I'm, I, we're absolutely yeah, going this, to. This has been an absolute blast, man. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Thank you guys both. I really, it was a lot of fun. Well, before we let you go, the last question that we ask every guest on the medicine is, you know, it, the medicine podcast is all about, exploring and leaning into the the medicines that guide us in creating conscious relationships with ourselves and our spirituality with movement with our our mission in the world every aspect um what for you currently feels like medicine <laughs> i would say the workouts so I, <laughs> for me this is a new this is a new thing. So every day I'm working out about an hour and a half. And um, before, when I was doing this on my own, I was just doing like kettlebell push-ups, you know, jump rope, stuff like that. I recently changed over to weight machines and getting into like utilizing weights in a different way. And like the way that I feel after doing that, a lot of times it's hard getting up because I'm doing it early in the morning. A lot of times it's hard to motivate myself, but the medicine is when I'm done with that workout and the rest of the day, the energy that it gives me and the way my body feels is so different. And so for me, that would be the new thing that I feel like is the medicine. And I think it also encourages you on those days where you're wanting to be, uh, make poor decisions on food, you know, because yeah. of, um, convenient or, you know, you're in a hurry. I think it makes me slow down and make better decisions about the food that I'm eating. So it's been really a medicine for me to have those workouts incorporated recently. Yeah. To yeah. that degree. Love hearing that. Yeah. There's, there's nothing like, you know, seeing Paul check with his shirt off at 61 <laughs> years old, completely jacked out of his mind to motivate yeah. you working out. So it's true. Uh, it's so true. Yeah. Totally Man. That, but, uh, but it is one of those things that like you you there is immediate feedback that like this is good for me it's immediately yeah. uplifting it gives you energy and and we're right there with you and when you start your day with something that's physically demanding and really fucking hard moving a lot of weight with your body yeah. you go into the rest of your day not only energized but with the attitude of i know i can do hard things like 
this, whatever I'm doing here is not harder than, you know, lifting my body weight in a deadlift. <laughs> yeah. I'm six two. I'm, you know, I have broad shoulders. I'm a bigger build person. Uh, I mean, you know, there's people like Kyle that I feel very not strong around, <laughs> but, 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 you know, um, I, so when I started working this, let's see, last week, I was like adding up all the weights and the reps that I did. And it was over 10,000 pounds for the hour and a half of like doing the reps and getting up to, you know, a bench press, you know, at a certain weight and just feeling like, holy crap, like, you know, just in the last three months, I've gone to where my body's gotten stronger. And to really f- look at how much weight you lifted in that hour and a half time of doing those reps um, was like n- a confidence booster. But it's like you said, you went through the rest of your day like I did that. So, you know, bring it on. What, yeah. el- what else? You- so, totally. Yeah, I th- it's been it's been very um, helpful with a lot of areas in my life, you know, to get that started. Absolutely. Love that for you. So good. Well, right, we guys. could probably talk to you for another three hours uh, <laughs> for you back on at some point. Um, but thank you again for being here and, and gifting us with your your genius and your wisdom and uh, just being open. You know, these these are the stories that we want to share. And the fact that you, you know, really were able to alchemize and transform these really tough situations into something that is literally gifting people all over the world is I can't say enough good things about. So thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you guys. You guys have amazing energy and amazing hearts and it's been fun. And so thanks so much. Thanks so much, brother. Thank you guys yeah. for hanging in there and hanging with us today. Uh, check the show notes, check the description box, uh, go check out Ian's stuff. You won't regret it. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Go spread some light. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed that, check out right over here for some more fun clips. Oh, and you're going to want to subscribe. Bye.